I'm George Fenneman to his Groucho. <laughs> he is, he is um, Tim Haller, who this is our fifth, sixth edition. We're having a hell of a lot of fun. Tim ha- Haller, son of Tom Haller, nephew of Bill Haller, in his own right, a, um, a terrific personality, terrific at this, and the former minor league baseball player himself. And we got a great show. We're going to talk about Giants prospects, A's prospects, what's coming up, um, spring training, what's going on with the Giants season, what's going on with the A's season. But first, as um, is my want, I uh, like to find out about the minor league experience. I was the Topps representative, the baseball card representative on the West Coast in the 80s and 90s, and I got a little touch of minor league baseball that was so terrific uh, during the summers up in uh, the, up in Washington State and Oregon and California. I did the Midwest League a, a number of times, and it was terrific. And most most people follow baseball. Even avid fans are um, familiar with these players once they reach the majors, but minor league ball is unique and um timmy uh give me give me some stories tell me tell me first when you were first signed what the adjustment was coming into ball talk to me a little bit timmy Ball. i will i will um okay well you know the some of the the real uh prolific memories are you know the sign the day i signed <laughs> Tom Giordano came to the house in San Mateo. He flew all the way out from uh, Maryland uh, to sign me, and we sat in our living room. My dad sat across from us uh, from the coffee table in the living room. My dad was at the time the general manager for the Giants, and uh, he asked prior to Mr. Giordano coming uh, to the house if he could sit in with us. And I said, absolutely, but I, I, you have to promise me you don't say a word. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I said, I told you, you can't, you got to keep your mouth shut because you could, you could hamper my negotiation skills. <laughs> he's he's you know already what? general manager of the Giants. He's had a major league career. Kids are kids, aren't they? <laughs> That, yeah, and, um, and and he had an opportunity to sign me previously, and he failed to do so. So he had to sit there and kind of hold his handkerchief and uh, bite his lip because, um, you know, he had me in his grasp at one time, and then another time I wasn't available to him. And so uh, <laughs> Mr. Giordano showed up at the house. I made my request. There wasn't a blink of an eye. Um, I was able to get a college education and some money and a new truck, and uh, we left. Mr. Giordano left and went, took his flight back to Maryland, and I can remember closing the front door and my dad almost having a massive coronary. He said, "I can't believe you got what you got, and you asked for what you wanted. You, you know, you were, you were great." And I said, "Well." You know what? I figure you go for it, or you, or you, you know, or or you don't. And so, um, and the next day, I was on a plane down to uh, Miami, Florida, to work out uh, with uh, a lot of their draftees and their in, um, invites to a camp because they were determining in June whether you know where these guys were going to go. So, my first experience was going to uh, Opelika, Florida. Uh, right. And it, it, the same 
area or same school that the dolphins worked out. Um, okay. So, uh, so, but it was... So Southern Florida, how about the weather in Southern, Southern Florida? You're a California kid. All of a sudden, you are first time with some humidity. Some? Right. And, uh, and you know, it wasn't that bad. I didn't really think about it much because sure. the first, uh, the primary thing in my mind was playing ball, you know, and uh, having that experience. So for the first few days, everybody met down there, and it was an interesting experience because um, there were probably about 70 guys at this camp, and they had to to uh, to take a look at us and then evaluate us that quickly and then send us to either the um, Appalachian League, which is a rookie ball, uh, right. or to the New York Penn League, which was also another uh, rookie ball league. Yeah, it was a short A <laughs> league. So. Right, short A. And then um, so after the first day uh, and walking into the clubhouse, there were – I bet you 25 guys that were already told to go home. So they were already pink flipped and, oh, you know, and some of them were, you know, draft picks, uh, guys that uh, they had signed already. And some guys were invite invitees that came. And so I already got to witness a little bit of the, you know, the, the realities of professional baseball in my, you know, first day or so of camp. And then, uh, we worked out, and we really didn't swing a bat or even work out in the field until the third day because all we did was run, and they wanted to time us. They timed us in the 40-yard dash. They timed us in the 90, or excuse me, a 60-yard dash multiple times. They timed us from first to third, and they timed us from second to home. Um, and we did that, you know, several different times, so they had, uh, you know, several times on each guy right. and uh so the fourth day we were uh given uh our club and i was sent to bluefield west virginia and the difference between the guys in bluefield and the guys that went up to the Penn league in newark uh they played in newark new jersey i think they were in new jersey or i can't even remember what if it was newark new york but they got to fly. New Jersey. They got to fly out of uh, Miami. And we stuck around another day, and we took a bus from Miami to Bluefield, West Virginia. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Only tell you, uh, here we go. And this was my, you know, first experience of a long bus ride, and I haven't even played a game yet. And, Who's your um, manager? Who was your first manager? I, I can't even remember that guy because if, if this is what happened. We took a bus ride. We stopped in Charlotte, North Carolina to switch buses. It was the di next day. I mean, because it took us forever to, just to get to Charlotte. And then, then we took a bus from there to Bluefield. Uh, we got up. We went to the ballpark. We stayed at a Motel 6 or some dive, and we, we, walked, we walked to the ballpark. And this ballpark was just, it was charming. It was, it was just, uh, you know, it, it, it was my first experience with professional baseball. I can't even remember who my manager was. Uh, we opened up on a Friday night. I went... I don't even remember. I hit five home runs in my first three games in this first series. Whoa, whoa! So Monday morning, I'm Moving I'm still I'm still in the I'm still in the Motel Six. I haven't had a chance to get out and look for an apartment, or you know, even get a roommate to get an apartment. <laughs> and Tom Giordano knocks on my door at six a.m. in my motel room. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I'm going to get released already. And uh, so he comes in, uh, sits down, and he goes, well, do you want the good news or the bad news first? And I said, well, give me the bad news. And he goes, pack your bags. And I said, okay. And he goes, now the good news is you're going to the Florida State League. Now, 
that was a big deal for me because obviously the Florida State League was high A, um, considered a very competitive, a very good pitching league. Um, there were some guys that had played, you know, the majority of the guys that had played uh, in that league had two or three years of professional baseball under their belt. And so from there, it was planes, trains, and automobiles. Um, I ended up bouncing all over from Bluefield to Charlotte to flying to Atlanta, changing flights, going to probably Orlando, if I'm not mistaken, and then getting a, a little puddle jumper over to Daytona and being picked up by the general manager's assistant in her Corvette and getting to the ballpark and it was probably the sixth inning of the game that night. So it was uh, a good 12 hours of shuffle and packing and travel. And uh, after the ball game, I went in and I put my gear in the my locker, and it was, you know, I felt like, okay, now I can settle in a little bit. And I did. I played a full year there in uh, Daytona Beach and had a really, you know, pretty good year. What's the big difference between California and Florida in terms of, of living? You know, Florida was an adjustment, obviously, because we talked a little bit about the humidity, the weather. It was very sticky. Um, it was really hot all the time. And very consistently, about 4.30 in the afternoon, we would have a 20-minute downpour, uh, right. you know, right during batting practice. Um and it was just hot and humid, and then the the bugs are huge. The palmetto bugs, uh, you can take them for a walk. If you had a leash, you can take it out for a walk. And I remember, you know, going into my kitchen at my mo- uh, little little apartment in Daytona and pulling out a box of cereal and this huge alien creature crawling out from the box and me throwing the whole box of honeycombs up against the kitchen wall so these insects and bugs were a lot different in florida than uh in california that's for sure um but uh it was a lot of fun it was a great experience for me seeing my first year pro ball adjusting a little bit to pitching you know and to uh using a wood bat consistently all the time Right. Uh, that is but it was a great experience, and I had some really character, real characters as teammates. So one of my my road roommate was a kid named Bill Ripkin, and uh, we know him as Cal, Cal's little brother. Great guy. We, we had a baseball card, don't we? We had we we had a lot of fun together, <laughs> Bill and I, uh, rooming on the road, etc. And and of course, we had a lot to talk about because of our our past and our and our growing up in yes, in baseball, you know, and I still they uh, have great respect for Billy. I think that he does a great job on MLB, um, and a couple of other characters. A guy named Kurt Bemisterfer, who who is a good ball player catcher out of USC, was on our club, um, and, a, and another guy. I don't know what happened to Tony Triplett. He was a center fielder that could run, and he set the stolen base record that year uh, with us uh, for the Florida State League. He stole over 100 bases, which is quite a feat because we played 142 games in that league. And uh, so, you know, he he was a pretty good ball player. But uh, that was a lot. If he was a, rela- if he was a son or a grandson of Mel Triplett, who played uh, – he's a defensive back with the jo- – no, he was a fullback, as a matter of fact – with the New York football giants, I mean, triplet. Um, yeah, this guy was tall, lanky. He probably was about six three, six foot four, and weighed 160 pounds. Whoa. But he could fly. He could really fly. He had a good arm, and he covered a lot of ground out in center field. <laughs> so, um, and and then uh, and it just so happened there was another guy from uh, San Carlos that a kid named Chris Wilshire who ended up having shoulder issues and rotator cuff problems, but he was a hometown kid that uh, we were able to reconnect on that club, too. Right. So you get to spend time, a lot of time, away from home, a lot of time on the road. Uh, How does a minor league player, what do they do on the road? Is it mostly buses, but 
a lot of reading, a lot of music, a lot of meditation, um, a lot of partying. What's it like being well, a minor league you know, player? A minor league player, at least in single A ball, we were getting $7 a day for meal money. So there was a little dine and dash. We would go into a place like a, a buffet type situation. And uh, back then, because of probably people like us, you paid on your way out. Well, we would scatter before we had to pay. Uh, so there was a lot of fast food and, and such. Um, a lot of the 99 cents, six packs of Milwaukee's best beer, um, that sort of thing. So we had to be pretty frugal and prudent with our money uh, because we weren't making that much. And I was making $800 a month. And, uh, you know, that, that's that's not enough to live on. But because I was still a full-time college student, I was informed that I could go ahead – and claim zero, or they could. I was not taxed, so I was grossing eight hundred a week or a month, and uh, so that was nice. I'd, every two weeks, I'd get four hundred dollars in my pocket, but I'd have to pay my rent and you know, uh, et cetera. And uh, you know, so, it was you know, you scrap. You just try to make do with what you got. And you st- I started when I went down there for that little mini camp and. At o- in Opelika, Florida, I weighed, you know, 198, 200 pounds. And when the season was over, I weighed 165. So, I mean, that Whoa. it takes a lot out of you. I mean, you don't eat right. Your travel, your sleep is off. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's that, those little intangibles. And I didn't, you know, and back then the guys didn't, you know, have anything really to beef up. They didn't, at least I wasn't aware of anything going on as far as, you know, protein, right. and it's pre, right. pre-steroid era, so. Androids, uh, this, that, or the yeah. other thing, that, uh, that hadn't come into play. Had greenies, were greenies a big part of it, amphetamine? You know, they were, they were available, you know, and they were, and they were passed around. I, for whatever reason, and uh, this might appeal to you, I, I, it may just, may not be the case, but. Anytime I took something like that, it would make me calm. I don't know why. The way I was chemical, I'm chemically balanced or whatever, anytime I took an amphetamine of any sort, it would mellow me out, which is a little different. I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy the feeling. And I didn't smoke marijuana during the season, but I did smoke a lot of pot when I was younger. And um, I liked it. And and it gave me energy. I would work out in the off season. You know, I smoke yeah, pot. I don't work out. The way you now, said now it, was so just... cute. it was so cute the way you said it. And I liked it. <laughs> you could. Oh, I did. We could do I it absolutely. Did. <laughs> and, uh, but the funny thing about it is, and I want to express this to all of our listeners: don't do this at home. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't, I don't think uh, I would talk to young guys today and say, hey, it's okay if you smoke a little pot before you play or before you work out. It's counterproductive. And uh, I wouldn't suggest uh, a young aspiring athlete to do that. But I did it. It was part of my culture. It's part of, what, how, what you know, growing up in the Bay Area, uh, listening to the Grateful Dead and the, and the airplane and, you know, the list goes on. Uh, and, and, you know, I was just part of that culture growing up. So, now, you know. Part of the big league culture when you were sitting around in locker rooms. Pot was, pot was not the thing. I'm sure of that. Well, there were a few guys that smoked marijuana, you know, and I'm not going di- to disclose anybody's names or, or anything like that. But I, I, there was, you know, a, a, at least five to eight guys who smoked pot. Oh, really? You know, I, sure. I, I, on a 25-man roster, sure. As a pot smoker, I would think it would be detrimental and counterproductive to an athlete. Just, um, I'm doing this. It's productive from a creative standpoint, but I'm not going out there and looking for a curveball and trying to hit a fastball. Well, you know, but that's the thing. We, I didn't. I don't know about anybody else, but I certainly didn't get high before I was play, or when I was playing or during the season, because that was sort of counterproductive. I, I, I would try to, you know, after a long week and no, 
you know, we'd go 14, 15 days in a row without any uh, any days off or a rain out or whatever. Um, I would I would drink myself to sleep on some occasions. I'd have a six pack of beer and a pint of bourbon and try to relax that way, you know, after a okay. uh, a long series or whatever. But um, rest was so critical because of the of you know the pace that we kept you know with uh with all the games and the travel you know rest was a premium can we talk about player development a little in the minors did you have sure. roving scouts that would co- ro- not roving scouts roving instructors who would come around and help you game was there anybody in particular that you dealt with that helped you along that you thought was a good Absolutely. Team? Two of the guys that I recall and I have very dear places in my heart, uh, when, when I was later uh, in the White Sox organization, a guy named Jose Cardinal uh, and, yes. Dick Allen, and Dick Allen. And Jose worked with me a lot on base running, and and some he gave me uh, insights into how to become a little faster and quicker. I think that... Uh, when you, you looked at Tim Howard's card and you wanted to, uh, you know, see his strengths, my strength was I could run. I mean, I could I could hit. I was a switch hitting hitter, uh, batter. You know, I hit both ways. A good right. fielding uh, second baseman, but I could I could fly. I could really run. And um, he gave me some, and he worked with me because he knew that. I think that. Um, when I was in the Florida State League, I, I never even got thrown out. I think I stole 28 bases that season and was never caught. I stole third base 14 times. So uh, he really worked with me a lot on my base running and, and tried to hone my just being quicker and, and uh, you know, maybe faster. First uh, and crossover stuff. That kind of thing, the shuffle, a lot of it was shuffle. All of it was footwork and and rhythm and timing and being able to read because each pitcher has their own idiosyncrasies and their ways of doing things and you have to really look and study a pitcher left-handed right-handed what you know how do they maneuver around the rubber that kind of thing uh, and then and then get to know the infielders and how they defend guys that are hitting behind you and you know that kind of thing and always being aware of uh the outfielders, their posi- where they're positioned, and what kind of arms they have. You have to really be, uh, if you want to be successful, you have to always really have be tuned in on all of those things. <clears throat> and a lot of it is untaught. You have to t- tell yourself, okay, if this is what I want to accomplish, I have to do this for myself. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. They, uh, they just wouldn't do it. There were a couple of occasions when I hit ground balls to the center field center fielder that I'd stretched into doubles and did pop-up slides at second base because they were either lollygagging or they would take their eye off of me and I would just turn on the burners and, and head into second. And, you know, it would just throw that's them Jackie out of Robinson, That's Ricky Henderson, Jackie Robinson-like stuff where it changes the game. You get in scoring position. People don't realize the strategy of you're on first, you're not going to score on a ground ball up the middle, but you're on second, you just may. And there's, um, getting the guy over is very, very important. So you taking that extra base, is uh, you become a game, game changer. Right. And then, and then uh, as far as my hitting uh, assistance in, with the White Sox, Dick Allen was my uh, hitting instructor. And, One of the most uh, fascinating guys in baseball history, and and you know what he he's, he's he is nothing like what he's been portrayed as. If, if you ever knew Dick Allen and got an opportunity to really spend a lot of time with him, I, I think uh, the impression you would have would be different than what the media has portrayed him as. You know, I had the work. You know, good fortune of he played with the Dodgers when my dad was with him for a year. Oh, so. I had the good fortune of meeting him, and, you know, I was just a youngster, but having the opportunity to to uh, meet him, and, and, and he remembered me. So he took to me, too. And right. when he was around, you know, we were I was hitting balls in that cage until my hands were bleeding because I wanted his 
I wanted his tutelage. I wanted his insight. I wanted his help. And so he was great for me. And he, he was just a wonderful Dick, person. Dick Allen, real quick, Lamar Johnson, who played with him uh, and was a minor league manager when I was doing tops, told me that there was no one he ever saw that could hit a ball where the ball comes off the bat faster than Rick. Yeah. yeah, Dick Allen was so strong, and he used this log of a bat. I mean, it was just massive. Uh, was Willie Mays like he wasn't a bi- he was built along the same lines of wasn't very tall, but no, but he, he was fit. And, and you know, built like a racehorse, you know, and exactly he was just strong, and he had that innate ability. That God-given ability to turn on a, on a pitch and quick-wristed. You know, Henry Aaron wasn't that big at all. Henry Aaron was small. Uh, 5'10", 175. Second. Yeah, second baseman. Yeah, absolutely. And so these guys had an ability to, you know, just see the ball, recognize it, and their wrist and their upper body would uh, – their lower body would follow through with their upper body. It was just – it. It's a thing of magic. These things are God-given talents. You can work forever in a cage. And guys like Aaron and Mays and Allen, those guys just, they were born to be able to hit a baseball. You know, so. Play with the kid. He's an old, old gentleman like myself. His name was Jimmy Wynn, and he ended up with the Dodgers. Right, he, right. He was a lot like that, a small guy. Banks was yeah. no, no monster. Um, hitters come come in all different shapes and sizes, and it's all about getting through the strike zone and and those wrists. And, and another guy that comes to mind, maybe the smallest of all those guys you you mentioned, even smaller than Jimmy the Toy Cannon, was uh, Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan was just uh, a little guy. He was a squat, but boy, he was so quick, and he and he and he was strong. You know, he had that center of gravity, and he could just turn on a pitch in a heartbeat in a second. <clears throat> and he, you know, you know, he's a Hall of Famer. You know, um, so that's the one thing I love about baseball. You don't have to be the biggest guy. You don't even have to be the strongest guy. You just have to have these skills kind of come together all at once, and all of a sudden you've got some phenom in front of you, and. uh you know, I, I, I've never, you know, and we're going to discuss a little bit about evaluating minor leaguers and prospects and stuff. And there are some old school, uh, you know, scouts that'll, that, that want the eye test. You know, they want to look at a guy play. And I'm still a big advocate of that. Uh, you know, now the game has moved a lot towards the, uh, the, the mathematical saber metrics and et cetera. But you can never, I don't care who it is, you can never measure a guy's heart. And there, there's nothing on the chart that says will, personal human will. And they come back to yeah. how they, um, oh, absolutely. And, and how they develop. See, you look at a guy today when he's 20 and try to picture his body when he's 24. And that's that's something that um, you got to be good at. Well, you got to be good at that. But I think one thing that, and, and I don't know if it's overlooked, but it isn't. I don't think it's uh, enhanced, or uh, you know, it, they don't discuss it as much as they probably should. It should be up there on the top of their checklist as far as what is the person's character like. What is he like as a person? What are his standards, his ethics, his morals? Because <laughs> I, can, I can tell you more guys that didn't make the big leagues and they were sure, you know, no miss guys. Right. I can tell a lot more guys like that than the guys that, oh, this guy can't get past double A. He's never going to play past double A ball. Uh, that ended up having a 10 or 12 year career in the major leagues. You know, they're, they're, you know, and I could, I could go on and on about these guys that had the size, the ability, the talent, but whatever was going on between their ears, you know, didn't allow them to make it. 
It could be fear of failure. It could be fear of success. Um, it could be lifestyle choices. It could be. It, it could be. A, it could have been a girlfriend. It could have been. Uh, it could have been a number of different things that didn't allow that guy to achieve getting to the major leagues. So. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I can think of one guy in particular that just comes to mind now. There was an incredibly talented third baseman in the Giants organization by the name of Chris Brown. And Brownie could, was just phenomenal. I mean, he hit with power. He had great hands. He had a cannon for an arm. And for whatever reason, a little bit of the Pablo syndrome where he had that extra 30 or 40 pounds, and didn't care to want to work hard enough to to get around that scenario or that particular issue. issue. Uh, but you know he puttered out. You know he just didn't didn't for whatever reason. You know it didn't work out for him. And there are a lot more guys that are that way than um, than you know the guys that you know for sure will never make it and, and do show up at, in, in that at that level. Right. Uh, Chris Brown was ter- terrific. God rest his soul. He passed away. I think he was uh, overseas, if I'm not mistaken. He, um, uh, just one of the wars. He was a contractor with something, a truck driver. Passed away, if I'm not mistaken. Does that ring a bell? You know, I'm not quite sure about that. I can't I can't tell you yes or no on that. I'm not sure. Um, you know, but... You know, that's just the way it goes. I, there were, you know, a lot of guys that had a lot of ability, but for one reason or another, just couldn't get it all together. And then you look at a guy like, you know, the I played against Omar. Conversely, the overachievers, am I right? The guys that you don't think have, have that physical ability. Uh, Pete Rose, of course, comes to mind. You play with anybody like that that just would not right now, I, I mean, the one guy that comes to mind, and I believe he's a Hall of Fame player. <laughs> but if you were to see him play a ball, his name was Omar Vizquel, and he oh. probably was about five foot six, one hundred and twenty pounds. He couldn't hit a ball past the pitcher if he made contact. But if you <laughs> saw him put a glove on and go out to shortstop. This guy made Ozzie Smith look like he was playing junior varsity ball at, you know. Uh, we got to see him in San Francisco toward, towards the very end of his career, but there were two or three years there where he was silk. I mean, this guy had a pair of hands, and he he was, as you say, as, uh, as proficient a shortstop as I ever lived. And you say you saw him, he was five foot six, couldn't hit the ball out of the infield. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, but when he put a glove on, it, something happened. It was magical. And so when he came up with the Mariners, they knew that about him, and they realized that eventually he's going to grow physically. He'll grow into his, uh, you know, he'll mature, he'll get thicker, he'll get stronger. Uh, and his work ethic was, I mean, he probably took 500 ground balls a day for years, you know. I mean, and that's what, you know, uh, made him so great. And eventually, eventually he caught up to the pitching and he got stronger. <laughs> and he is a very respectable hitting shortstop. And, um, you know, he he was probably right with Ozzy Smith uh, as far as the the best fielding, and best hitting shortstops. I'm not talking about a Cal Ripken, of course, or even an Alan Trammell who had power, but guys that were above and beyond anybody else defensively. Right. When you mention Ozzy Smith and you're talking about guys in their early development, he was traded for Craig Templeton one-on-one. And yeah. talking about guys that um, had a great body and – with Craig Templeton, and just a, not a mind for baseball. Not, I remember him saying, "If I don't make the first team, the first All Star, you know, start on the All Star team, I'm not even going." And he was like 22, 23 years old. So some guys had that, and then you see Ozzie Smith, how he developed. Uh, he couldn't hit when he first came up. He was not a a big yeah. hitter. 
and um, he became a pretty proficient ball player, pretty f- proficient hitter. <laughs> he was one of the best. And, uh, you know, so that's where I, I sort of retract now and say, you know, attitude really prote- uh, it, it predicates everything. If you have the right mindset and the right work ethic, you can become a little bit better than what you were when you first got there. Um, right. And then, you know, I, so, you know, I've been able to see and witness some of these guys that have incredible ability, great talent, uh, things that you can't teach somebody, you leave them alone, but something short wires within their ear, you know, between their ears, and they, they, st- they just, they don't, they don't get it. And then, then the guy that wants to be nothing more than play in the major leagues works ten times harder than everybody else, and that hard work and that attitude pays off for him. Can we go back just a little bit to, to Billy Ripken and if there was anything, I mean, his dad was a coach, manager for years, a baseball lifer. Were there, was there anything you can remember he passed on about the family situation, the, the instructional part, and what drove those people? They, um, obviously, Cal was just a driven guy. <laughs> you just, every day you get up. You can't always feel 100%. I mean, he broke Lou Gehrig's record, for crying out loud. And that meant a lot to baseball. And that meant a lot to baseball at that time. Because baseball was going through a real rough time with the strike. And him him doing that, um, along with McGuire and Sosa and all that. But uh, Rifkin was big. Tell me some Rifkin family stories that you remember, if you would. Well, you know, the, the the connection that I had obviously was with Billy and, you know, the the long conversations he and I would just have together or if we were at a, a function or a dinner or a whatever uh, the scenario. And he would share with me what it was like growing up in that home, in that family. Um, you know, his father loved the game of baseball. He was a pretty good player, too. He was a catcher with the Orioles, uh, and never really had an opportunity to play in the big leagues, but they extended a, an offer to him to coach and then to manage in the minor leagues and, and then ultimately come up and coach third base. Um, and, you know, just like any other family, uh, Ralph, I mean, Hallers were extremely dysfunctional. The Ripkins were as well. He had a couple of brothers. One was a biker guy and kind of in trouble a lot and, uh, you know, uh, Maybe another sibling, I think, too, was uh, a, a little bit of a distraction. <clears throat> but then you had two boys, you know, one cow who was bigger and stronger than the others and that, that loved the game and, and really, uh, you know, his dad took him under his wing. Uh, and then Billy, being the youngest of the, of the kids, sort of uh, idolizing his older brother. And, you know, just telling me the stories of Weaver and, and uh, being around the club and, and the big league club. And, and a lot of similarities, I guess you could say, between my life and his to a certain degree, but very different. One thing that I, I picked up on right away uh, playing in the Oriole organization was how different the American League philosophy was to the National League philosophy. Tell me a little um, bit about that. That's what I was going to ask Bill Lasky, who was going to be our guest, because uh, he played one season with Cleveland, and I w- wanted to know about the differences between the American National League. Well, um, you know, since the the under introduction or the advent of the uh, designated hitter, in the American League, of course, guys are going to um, – they're going to, they're going to, their pitchers are going to stay in a little bit longer, so they're going to get beat up a little bit more. Their ERAs are going to be a little bit higher, that sort of thing. The strategy is to score as many runs, obviously, than in both leagues to, than your opponent. But in the National League, um, I think the big thing is, uh, you know, you're trying to keep your opponent to the fewest amount of runs. In the American League, if you're winning six to four, six to five, you're okay. In the National League, you'll see a lot of scores at, you know, one to nothing, two to one, three to two, that sort of thing, right. because because you want to you want to preserve your your pitching. Uh, you don't want to get anybody in there too long. You don't want to get them lit up. 
In the American League, you can leave that guy in a little bit longer and maybe give up another run or two because you think you're going to be able to get it back when you're up again. Uh, so that that was it was a much more offensive minded uh, philosophy in the American League as opposed to the National League. And I always thought, and I still do to a certain degree, I think you're better overall pitchers pitch in the National League. And the guys that really are competitive want to stay in the National League. Guys like Grinke, obviously, he didn't want to go back to the American League. The way that uh, managers use their – at- and they enjoy their at bats too. They're athletes. They want to. Um, they want to help themselves. That's a big part of the game, I think. It's big, and I think that a lot of them really take a lot of pride in preparing themselves to be able to face major league pitching. Uh, and the Giants are just really blessed to have a guy like Madison Bumgarner who will, yeah. you know, will knock the ball out of the park four or five times a year for you, and and that helps his cause, and in turn, it helps the team's cause. You know, right. Let's talk a little bit of rookies for the Giants and the A's and uh, how you see things. I just uh, I'm more interested in your impressions than hearing my own voice. Uh, surprisingly, huh? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, don't be so hard on yourself. Uh, I, sometimes I listen to these shows and I, I go, I say, shut the up, <laughs> just let the man talk. <laughs> I say to myself, um, but. Please give – let's get a little A's. Let's pay homage to the A's. We've had the A's in the Bay Area since 1968. They won um, – at this point, the Giants have taken over as the darlings again of the Bay Area. But the A's did something that um, no other team has done since. They, they put three in a row together. What are your memories as a kid about watching the A's? And this is um, – we're talking 72, 3, and 4, when they won it all. And uh, do you remember any of your favorite players from those days? Uh, was it, um, you know, Campanaris or Reggie? You know, I think, I think that my memories are, are, are uh, I, I just remember some specifics about those clubs. One was they were always, they same lineup, and they always just they scrapped. I mean, they were they fought. They didn't get along real well either, personally, in the clubhouse. No. They when they got oh, between the line, yeah, when they got between the white lines, they were not going to be denied. And I remember it, they were very you know they were complimentary, just like the Giants are today. I mean, they have their star in Reggie Jackson, absolutely. But when you put a, a group of fellows around like that infield. Dick Green was a great second baseman. Campanis, a great shortstop. <laughs> um, Sal Bando at third base. Joe Rudy. Um, and then they would inter, you know, intermingle with some center fielders. Billy North was part of the, their winning. Uh, Angel Manuel for a while. The, um, yeah, North, Mike Heaton, Rick Monday, Rick, back from Kansas City, with, uh, Rick Monday came up with those guys. All those guys that Finley signed coming up, Catfish Hunter at the same time, Reggie Jackson, Bando. Uh, right. Gene Finnis, Gene Finnis, I thought, was uh, exceptionally good in postseason play, as Joe Rudy was. Some of these guys would sort of step it up a little bit when they got into the playoffs and the World Series. But what I remember about those guys is they played together as a team. I don't think you had any real big egos. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why teams are successful. You don't have that one guy that's a cancer or a distraction to what the common goal is. Um, so uh, that's what I remember most about the A's. Uh, and, of course, I identified with Dick Green just because I thought he was just a smooth-feeling second baseman and – he caught everything. He turned a double play better than anybody in the American League at the time. Uh, but, you know, he goes unsung because of all the other supporting characters on that club. Right. And so, um, and Fosse was terrific. I can remember Fosse in the middle of it uh, was just terrific in the middle of that lineup because he, he gave tennis a chance to play a little first base 
and remember they had the DH back then and that um, coming. It was just um, good times in Oakland, good times in San Francisco. They never coincided. So what's nice? What was nice was '89 when both teams won, and um, and that was great. And unfortunately. Um, I think for all fans, it, maybe the Oakland fans won't be as uh, agreeable to this as I as I feel, but I think that the earthquake really disrupted the Giants, you know, the players and the, everything, um, and they never were able to really get back in, on track, and the, and the A's handed it to them, uh, no doubt, and it's kind of unfortunate because in this particular case. Nature and mankind overrides anything we do on a baseball field. And I, I think that the delay and uh, all of the tragedy that happened really just took away any focus or competitive will uh, for the Giants. Uh, and and so the A's already had, a what, a two-game lead? Uh, and they just kind of, you know, they just kind of just took it and ran away with it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, what do you see happening for the Giants this year? Do you see, uh, I think that if you want to ask me real quick, Hunter Pence's condition, his Achilles tendon, is going to mean an awful lot. This guy is, like you talked about, the heart and soul of the team, a guy that um, an overachiever, and I think he brings brings the team up when he's in there. And I think that's um, – he's struggling a little bit now. So – yeah, and it's unfortunate because you would love to see him in there every day. I think that the uh, the saving grace for the Giants, and this is where they they shine more than any other club uh, that I, I you know that I've been looking at and studying and, and getting to know a little bit about their development programs and guys that are prospects, et cetera. The Giants are loaded. They have some kids that could play at the major leagues right now. And they've got a couple of outfielders that are really uh, quite impressive uh, that are just, you know, knocking on the door. And, and you know, they, it impressed me so much when Panic got hurt last year and Tollinson came in, and it's almost like they did not miss a beat. He right. progressed. You can see this guy getting better every day he played, which means this year they're deep uh, and you haven't had a, a giant team that was deep in the infield in many years. You look at it, Duffy, um, wow. I mean, you lost yeah. to Sandoval, but um, they didn't miss a beat there. Anything about Reggetti and Bochi? That, I mean, should these guys go in as a tandem? They should go into the Hall of Fame after all this. What can you say about those guys? Uh, look, uh, they're, they're, you know, in right place at the right time, too. But I think that both of them have the personalities and the temperament to work with these guys at that level uh, and to get these guys to buy into what they want to do. Um, obviously, Bochy is an incredible manager. He's a great psychologist. <laughs> he knows the game as well as anybody from a strategic point of view. He knows how to handle pitchers. He was a catcher his career. But then Dave Rigetti complements that. Uh, and the Giants have just done a really good job in terms of uh, scouting and drafting kids. I mean, they're so well balanced across the board in the minor leagues with good young arms um, that are knocking on the door to get to the big leagues. If one guy goes down, there's going to be somebody that will come up and replace them. Um, and I look at our outfield situation very similarly. You know, we've got a kid named uh, – Mac Williamson, who's who's got some pop. He actually hit two home runs today against uh, the Rangers in their um, in their Cactus League ball game. Um, you know, we saw this kid hit a, what five straight home runs last year. The left-handed hitting uh, outfielder, whose name escapes me right now, but he's not even on their top twenty prospect list. Um, and then they've got another young guy uh, who I think is 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 going to be an infielder either at shortstop or third base, and his name is um, Christian Arroyo, who is phenomenal. And, it, and it's a little bit scary because they have to decide what are we going to do. They just signed Brandon Crawford to a long-term deal, which was great, 
and they've got a kid at Duffy at third base who's really surprised everybody last year. But this kid, Christian Herrera, if he stays healthy and continues to develop, he's going to give those guys a run for their money. And then, of course, we've got Joe Panic at second base that we see he's healthy now, and we hope that he remains healthy because he works so well with that club. He's perfect in that number two hole uh, as a batter. And he and Crawford work so great together up the middle. But, you know, we're talking about uh, you know, this kid that you just mentioned, uh, the infielder that did a great job, Kelby Tomlinson, last year. Uh, so the, the Giants have some really good talent. And at the same time, some of these guys may end up being dealt for arms or, you know, maybe another solid catcher behind Posey. Who knows? Um, right. at this point, but their pitching prospects are phenomenal. Okay, let me just, before we get to the pitching prospects and before I forget, let me um, just ask you something. You were a second baseman, and you, sim- you just mentioned the double play combinations and working well. Tell me what goes into that and why sometimes it works between a shortstop and a second baseman. I remember with the Giants early on with Fuentes and Spire and how that came together. Tell me, tell me what goes into that and just how important it is to be strong up the middle and be in sync with the shortstop and the second baseman. Yeah, I, you know, how I express, how do I really express that? There has to be a chemistry, first of all. You have to be able to trust and. Uh, well, first of all, you have to be, be able to respect the guy that you're playing with. And then you have to trust him. And then you got to work a lot together as far as where you like throws. You know, when, you know, me coming across the bag at second base, I'm going to tell him where I appreciate my, my feeds for a double play. And depending on where the ball is and how it's hit and the speed of everything, you know, I spent years trying to turn a double play from every which way I could possibly do it and also work on throws that were down in the dirt or, you know, over my head, uh, be way behind the bag, way out in front of me. Uh, but as, as I worked with guys, some of the guys that I was able to, you know, do this with were Craig Shipley, Randy Velarde, uh, Billy Ripken. You know, we, we were able to have a chemistry to where we got to know each other uh, and, you know, in every aspect, where do you like the ball? Where do you, where do you prefer it? Uh, you know, especially if the ball's coming up the middle, who's going to take that, that ball? We're going to communicate. We're going to talk. Um, and then eventually, hopefully, in, in my case, I was fortunate enough, it just became very second nature for us. We turned a lot of double plays. I don't know the numbers of these guys that I played with. We turned double plays, but we, we were, you know, we probably led the league in turning double plays because we worked so hard at it. Now, um, just you have to have that chemistry. Past you have week, to. You have to have that. Just this past week, Major League Baseball and the union got together. They changed the slide-in rule coming into second base. Can you tell me a little bit uh, your impression of that? Is <laughs> well, I'm not a big fan of it. You know, that that's part of the game. I think that uh, – you know, when I played, if a guy like Chase Hutley came in hard, and especially he's a middle infielder, uh, you know, you gotta, you know, you got you gotta draw the line somewhere with that type of behavior. And we usually did it between the lines. We didn't. We need any governing body to tell us you can and you can't do that. Uh, we would take care of it ourselves. We, 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 it was dirty, yeah. but should have it changed the rule, or should have the player been penalized more? Or um, did you have to change the entire rule to make it work? Yeah, I, I'm not in favor of changing the rule. Baseball's been played for a long time, um, you know, to, to just go out. And, and, you know, what it boils down to, uh, and you may agree or disagree with this, it's the money. You know, these guys are being paid a lot of money, and if they get hurt, you know, the, the club takes a big blow to their pocketbook. But I I think, you know, when you start to do that, it, it takes a little way, a, a bit away from the competitiveness of the game, 
the grit of the game, the psychological aspect of the game. Um, because if this were 20 years ago or 30 years ago and Chase Utley did that to uh, one of my teammates, well, Chase would probably be on crutches later that evening. Um, that's just the way we took care of business. Uh, or he would have been taking one off of his beam or in the ribs for that type of behavior. Nowadays, because these guys are making so much money, they nobody can afford to have these guys get severely injured. And that's an unfortunate thing. It, it kind of takes me to this, uh, the, the posy rule now, what they refer to as the home plate thing. Uh, I know my dad's rolling over in his grave because uh, of that change in that rule. Um, the catcher's got to be able to realize how to tag, how to man- maneuver around the plate, and not be in the way of an oncoming freight train. But I will say this, in the instance, in that particular play that Cousins ran into Posey, Cousins took a dive inside the, inside the plate. Buster was inside the plate. Didn't matter, didn't matter about the rule. He was still, he was D, where he was is where they, they established that rule to be now, inside the plate. Cousins went into Posey purposely and took him out bad. And that guy, I haven't heard from him. I don't know where he's playing baseball anymore. I don't think he's in the major leagues. I think I heard somewhere that he's in Japan or, or trying to hold on to, to uh, you know, his career. But I, I'm not a big fan of that either. Hey, if, you're, if you've got that gear on and you're going to block the plate, well, by golly, you know, that's what they're paying you to do. And at the same time, the guy running down the third baseline should learn how to slide properly, how to avoid the tag. Um, slide. And when, so we we played baseball for years, and on just a couple of occasions, not a lot, but on a few occasions, there's been some really bad uh, incidents, collisions, and injuries. Uh, and unfortunately, the powers that be figure it's a good idea to go ahead and, and soften it up a little bit. And I'm not in, a big fan of that. I'm, I, I, I feel like you gotta just let them play and, and injuries happen. Things occur. Um, and that's part of the game. Um, and, and, and the ball players will take care of it. Uh, they'll police their own, their own behaviors. And <clears throat> that's the, uh, that's sort of the long and short of how I feel about it, you know, but, it, it all comes down to money today and the, uh, you know, the money they're paying these guys and they, you know, that they, they don't want anybody getting hurt. And I understand that. Um, but in, injury is part of the game. You know, that's the risk you take. Well, you could almost equate it to the quarterback situation in the NFL where um, they've constant, they're constantly changing the rules to pr- protect the quarterback But as they are, and people go, wow, do you have to be a sissy? They're also realizing that there's a high preponderance of these players who are walking around with head injuries that don't know what town they're in. And um, so there has to be a happy medium in sports where you do protect the players from injury and themselves in a way because um, the competitive spirit is not – you know, you're a ball player and you still have that competitive spirit of the game's going to take care of itself. But um, the shortstop of the Mets, I can't even think of his name right now, and I'm a Mets fan, um, tore up his leg. I mean, I don't, he may come back from that, but um, so anyway. Well, uh, but what do you do? I mean, what do you do? I, obviously, Chase Utley did something that was pretty, pretty bad, you know, and, 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 I, I, and then being a middle infielder, I've been able to critique that whole play from the get-go. I think that the feed from the second baseman wasn't very good. I don't think that the shortstop positioned himself properly. He tried to get a little too fancy. He exposed himself to Utley coming in. Uh, and in a situation like that, you're, you're taught at nine years old in your first year of Little League, make sure one. You know, this ball was, I don't even think it would have been a double play ball to begin with. you got to make sure you get that one out. And these guys get a little bit too happy or greedy or a fancy or whatever you want to call it, and they, they, they can open themselves up to some injury. So 
you know, it, it's just the way it happened. It's part of the game. Chase Utley certainly didn't even hit dirt until he was past the bag, and he was a good he probably four feet. The, he was flying through the air over the bag. No question right. about that. And Absolutely. Uh, you know, so it was a dirty slide. It was a dirty play. Um, I, you know, I don't think these guys, because of their status today and their salaries, work on stuff like that anymore either. I really don't think that they work on taking out a guy legitimately at second base anymore. I don't think they work on sliding anymore. Um, I don't think they work on bunting enough. You know, but that's just me. That's just me. In the minors, at, now after spring training, obviously you're playing playing the league games. How much time is devoted to instruction? Because you're on the road so much, and um, how much is instruction? How much better did you get after after the season? Did you look back and say, "Wow, I, not only did I get the experience, but I really upped my game." Due to instruction. Yeah, and I think at that stage, you know, it's the repetition. It's the and it's good repetition. It's not, you know, how you hear people say practice makes perfect. Perfect. Well, perfect practice makes perfect. If you're doing bad things or you know ill-advised things, developing bad habits and continuing doing them, you're not going to improve. But when you're in the in the heat of a season, there's not a lot of time to work on changing anything. If you don't have the certain abilities or talents, you're going to get released or, you know, so be it, you're not going to play. Um, but if there's uh, – I think, if anything, we work more on hitting than we do anything else. Baseball, sure, we would take 40, 50 ground balls, you know, during bratting practice and get loose and get that timing and, that you know, feel the softness of our hands and our footwork getting right. Um, and just really, it was just a preliminary loosening up for the ball game. Um, it's basically what it what it what it does for you. So there's not a lot that you know you're working on to try to improve, obviously, because if you can't play at that level, then you're not going to play. Uh, so you already have that ability, those abilities, and and you're just loosening up, and you're and you're getting uh, you know getting your timing down, et cetera. Uh, but if you're going learning to learning your body and recovery time and um, what it takes to get ready for a game and how to wind down after a game and get your sleep and try to get a semblance of a diet that can sustain you. Right. And then I think that if you're going through a rut, like if you're 0 for 20, you know, you start doing some things from a hitting standpoint that's probably a bit more instructional or change, um, you know, to try to get out of that rut that you're in. Um, right. So, yeah, you know, I think from a, from an offensive standpoint, you're always trying to tweak and trying to improve. Hey, if you're good, you can only you if you're good in baseball, you're getting on 330 percent of the time. You know that anything else you do, if if you're if you're if your success rate is 30 percent. You know, you're selling appliances at Sears. I, 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 you know, but the the great players hit 300. So seven times out of ten, they're sitting down. They're failing. So this, you have to view it as very your given success. Exactly. Baseball is very forgiving. Great, even if you're great, you're failing more times than you're succeeding. And exactly. that's that becomes a mental game in that um, – how you handle the frustrations and how you concentrate in the field after not going well at bat. Can you address that a little bit, what that takes? Well, you know, um, I, I was the kind of guy that would probably take a that bat out with me, you know, right. to, to the you know, on occasion, on occasion, especially if there's a guy in running or scoring position and, uh, you know, there was something I could do to help contribute. Uh, but if I was leading off an inning and I, you know, flew out or grounded out or struck out or didn't get on base, it wasn't, I wasn't that disappointed. I was still bummed out, but, uh, you know, I didn't throw the helmet and, and you know, bitch and moan about something. Um, but when there's, you know, a situation where, you know, you want to get a runner in or move a guy over and you fail to do that, 
uh, you know, that, that, that's when the competitive, uh, the juice shows a little bit more. Um, you know, and, and fortunately for me, where I batted and I wasn't counted on on driving guys in, I was counted on getting scoring. I was, you know, they, I was getting on base so that they could get me in. But if we were in the ninth inning and we needed a guy on base and we were tied up or we were down a run, um, I, you know, I'd do whatever. I, I led the league in getting hit by pitches in the Florida State League. So, you know, if I plopped myself in front of a pitch to get on base, well, by golly, I was doing it. I think my on base percentage that that year was well over 400. And um, Tim, that's what, because what I got, year was that when you were in the Florida State League? The uh, the Florida State League, I want to say, was 84. But uh, it, a few brain cells and and uh, other things along the way. Okay. But uh, um, so. I remember that league because my family lived in Florida at the time, uh, as every Jewish family has to do. It's the law. Um, and <laughs> I'd, go back, I'd go back and visit and... Um, try to get as many Florida State League games in just to, to get up. What was your impression of Port St. Lucie and um, the, the different towns in Florida and um, just the politics of these towns, these small town people? <laughs> you know, they were interesting. Daytona was a different kind of town, obviously, because it more was of a destination place. You know, people would go there for vacations, et cetera. But when we were heading to Tampa or Miami or Fort Lauderdale, uh, you know, and the, and the different facilities, uh, you know, we played at the old Shell Stadium in Miami when they had a, they had a club down there called the Marlins, which was an independent team. Uh, it, in Fort Lauderdale, we played at the Yankees complex. They had a beautiful ballpark. Winter Haven was where the, where the Tigers were. So, you know, it was this small little sleepy town in the middle of Florida. Not a lot of fans came out. Those that did show up were diehard fans. Um, right. Tampa was a really beautiful ballpark. And then there were some really places that you never really wanted to go back to, uh, like Miami, because uh, if I recall, when we were playing one night, some guy was on the pay phone underneath the grandstand, and he got shot right in the head. So we had to stop the ball game for about 25 minutes, and, uh, you know, while all 13 fans ran up to the top of the stands to, underneath the shell to not get shot at or whatever, uh, you know, so, Whoa. you know, every, every, every ballpark had its personality. Daytona was a nice ballpark. It was a nice facility for back then. We had a nice clubhouse, uh, uh, nice grandstand. It was an older ballpark at the time. Now they've got a new stadium down there. Uh, it, the ballparks were big, so guys that led the league in home runs maybe hit 15. You know, uh, that's, that's what was the top of, uh, the home run production. Because we're looking at, a lot of them were the, the minor, big league, minor league facilities, you know, 430 to center field, uh, 340, 350 down the lines, you know, 385 to the gaps, uh, 395 to the gaps. So you had to have a little pop. And then the air was thicker. So, you know, the humidity and everything kind of made the ball do different types of things. It didn't have as much jump off off the bat. Um, well, that helps you as a fielder, I'm sure, too. Well, I, I, for me, it was great. I mean, I loved it because uh, the, the balls, even though some of the infields weren't taken as well of care of as other uh, infields, uh, there were some ballparks that just had bad hops all over them. Uh, but I can remember one complex in Osceola where the Astros played, beautiful facility, well maintained, et cetera, uh, well light, well, really good lighting, uh, you know, where the big league club played and worked out. Um, so, you know, the hops were good and true, uh, you know, everything, you play better when you're in a bigger, in a better venue. Uh, absolutely. Um, any minor league promotions that were fun and memorable for you that um, you participated in? Oh, well, you know, we would do like the car dealership thing or the local Wendy's, uh, <laughs> but nothing that really kind of nothing stands out. You know, not, not, you know, I mean, I, 
Yeah, I was, you know, and even back then, you know, the promotional stuff. Uh, I do remember, though, you know, as as far as playing and being on the field, Max Pacton being a part of some of the festivities and watching him play, and, you know, watching that kind of thing, or the chicken would go all over the place, and, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, but for as far player, as... They're probably pretty tuned out as a player. You're concentrating on getting ready for the game in your head and who's pitching right. and this and the other thing. Am I right? That, yeah, for the most part, you know, and, and, you know, as much as I enjoyed Max Pacton and watching his antics, et cetera, I didn't really want these guys being out on the field, you know, and he would go out and coach first base and do his goofy stuff and he would be a distraction. And I know it was all for the fans and stuff like that, but uh, I would have, I would have just been heartbroken if somebody got a hold of a line, you know, hit a shot down the line and knocked him in his, in his dome, and, you know, there's Max Pacton laid out in the first base of the coaching box, uh, you know, because that kind of stuff had happened. <laughs> uh, I remember I hit a foul ball. We were down in, in – uh, we were playing at Dodger Town, and I hit a, a foul ball straight behind home plate. They had a low screen, and there was a lady in a – these folks would come in their golf carts. Uh, and they were older folks. Maybe some of your aunts and uncles were attending, as a matter of fact, Ralph. And um, I unfortunately uh, just I'm missed this bit. I'm the aunt and uncle. I'm the old guy that's now. It's turned to when I go to a game, oh, sir, you want to watch? There's a game going on. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, and this is something that's that pretty tragic. tragic. This is really sad, but I had a foul ball. And I, I just missed this pitch uh, and it just screened this foul ball back up underneath the, the grandstand and it decked this lady and she ended up dying from the oh. – it hit her in her simple. And that, that took me a few days to kind of get out of my, my, my head. Uh, but those are the kinds of things when you're playing in these ballparks, uh, you know, uh, that, that can happen. That would be stunning. That would uh... – Brings to mind the Gil McDougal Herb Score thing when uh, Gil McDougal hit a line drive back in the late 50s and hit Herb Score in the eye and um, he was devastated. McDougal was devastated. Uh, he retired the next year. I don't. He never got his spirit back. It's it's a horrible thing. But this was a it is. ball and certainly not anything that you had control over. Or, um, no. And, you know, I mean, it's it's advisable for people that go to a ball game that they need to pay attention. I know that now Major League Baseball is – they're doing some studies, and, and I think they're getting ready to come to a decision to uh, extend the netting all the way down the third baseline, which is probably not a bad idea. Um, but, but the only thing I can say is if you're going to go to a Major League Baseball game or uh, any baseball game for that matter, watch the action on the field. It isn't a social hour. You come there and watch a baseball game. It's okay to, you know, to banter and enjoy each other's company. But when they're playing, pay attention because a foul ball will definitely do some major damage. And if if you're not paying attention, somebody's going to get hurt. Absolutely. Let's get back to some prospects. I'm gonna you threw one at me. I'm gonna throw one at you. I think that there's a um, left-handed pitcher in the Giant organization named Josh Osich, and he's coming up as a relief pitcher, and that's why I started following him. Most relief pitchers start out as starters, and they, for one reason or another, gravitate to the bullpen either. Um, they don't have three pitches, but they're overpowering in one or another. But Osage is being brought up as a relief pitcher, and it's going to be interesting for me to follow him and see how that um, takes shape. So, um, I agree. He had a really good introduction last year. He did a great job, and I think he's really de- there to fill the position left by um, Jeremy Affelt. Right, which are big shoes to fill, by the way. I felt in a, talk about that. A guy retires, and 
it's not just his stats, it's not just his numbers. It's what he is like in the clubhouse, in the bullpen, what effect he has on other players. Affelt is a guy that's really going to be missed. That's my guess. Well, he is, and that's what the, you know, the, the Giants have orchestrated. They've, they're architects of these incredible bullpens, just like some of the other great teams in Major League Baseball. But they have a method and a madness to who's going to throw to particular batters, lefty, righty, whatever. Um, uh, Lopez is a great example of that. He comes in and gets that really tough left-handed hitter out. He'll throw two or three pitches, and he's done for the night, You know, which is a big difference than what we saw 20, 30, 40 years ago in baseball. The way the, the Giants handle their staff is is – you know, it's really remarkable, but they have the arms and the talent, you know, to do this. Osich is one of them. You know, I agree with you. He's going to be phenomenal. Uh, but he's only ranked 10th as far as the top prospects on that club, in that organization, which oh, is uh, right. The, the the other guy that I'm that quite makes, impressed That makes them very, very deep. It does. Um, I know. I know they're deep at shortstop. I know they're deep enough at shortstop to move Christian Arroyo over to third. And um, I remember hearing about Lucius Fox as a shortstop that's got great range. Um, anybody on the A's come to mind that you, th- you can think of that uh, you've been following? or can ha- I think the A's are very, very interesting to me. I think on the field... They're pretty solid. I mean, they picked up a little power in Davis. Their pitching staff is a big question mark. They have Doolittle coming back as a closer, Sonny Gray, and four guys, four or five guys as start, listed as starters that I don't know much about. Can, can you tell me about those guys? Is there anybody yeah. that... Um, the open days are an enigma. They, they you know, and... And Billy Bean is as intelligent he is and as masterful as he is in terms of putting together a roster. Um, they'll be competitive. I know that they will. But right. you know, you never hear of any of these guys. You never, you never really know what you're going to get until they're out there. Uh, you know, I do. I'm familiar enough with the A's to know that they're a little bit long in the tooth now in center field. Coco Crisp is in the twilight of his career. Um, they let a lot of, I think, a lot of good ball players go in deals and trades to try to bolster them for like a late run uh, for the playoffs, et cetera. Um, right. Their minor league prospects are um, are okay. They don't compare anywhere near what the uh, what the Giants, you know, have as far as minor league development or anything of that nature. Uh, I think that some of the acquisitions that they have made, like John Axford, who's a proven right-handed arm out of the bullpen, will be pretty good. Uh, Sean Doolittle is an example of how the lifespan of a closer is not very long. You know, if you get a guy that does 10 or 12 years in a closing role, you've been you've been fortunate. But now right. he's starting to experience uh, injury issues, et cetera. And, guys you know, like this – and Smith and those guys. Who yeah, those guys were rich. Those guys were worry from year to year. You know, these guys are going to be there. Has to help in building an organization. Um, the guy with the A's that I think about is Franklin Barreto, who um, basically is just Donaldson all over again um, because they traded for him. And they keep doing that. They build guy. They build the team. They trade him off. Alderson is absolutely handcuffed by the financial situation, and baseball is handcuffed because they're pay, they're on a welfare system. The teams that aren't doing it, like the A's, they're they make a profit because Major League Baseball um, kicks back to these players. Uh, um, the teams that spend a lot of money have to pay a luxury tax. That luxury tax comes back to the A's. For instance, they build up an organization. They've always had tremendous scouting, player development, and they end up selling these guys off because they can't sign them to long-term contracts. And I think the A's, um, 
stadium issue is at the root of it? Well, I think that's the forefront of the problem with the Oakland A's is they do not have a, 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 a ballpark that is going to attract a lot of uh, fans, for one. Uh, free agency, I don't know a lot of free agents that are signing with the Oakland A's. There's nothing appealing right now. And I think that the, on the forefront for Oakland is they've got to figure out a place uh, to build a new ballpark or they're going to move. And I would hate to see that happen. Uh, and then the commissioner just came out last week, and they're starting to do some early studies for expansion for two more clubs. Um, oh, is that right? That's what they and, need, absolutely. Two more clubs. And and I, I'm, serious... not a big, I'm not a big fan of that, but I think that we need oh. to take care of what we have at the moment. And uh, I think that Oakland, uh, if they can get off of their uh, political high horses, there, there are a few places that would be sufficient for a new ballpark. But because could of politics Jack and losing the square, could you imagine these two beautiful, a beautiful gem of a ballpark looking over at another beautiful gem of a ballpark in San Francisco? They could, um, it would be the perfect place. It would regenerize, regenerate downtown Oakland. And Major League Baseball, Oakland, whoever it is, they don't learn from Colorado and San Francisco. See the surrounding neighborhoods, how they've come up um, south of Market Street because of of, um, of the sure. giants between AT&T and and China Bars and was restaurants. <laughs> Hotels, everything, you know, and, and uh, they just don't see, they don't see the, 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 the longer picture. Um, and it's an unfortunate thing because I think that the Oakland A's are competitive. They put a good product on the field. Unfortunately, they don't draw anywhere near like the Giants do, and that's because of their venue. And bottom line, if you don't have a nice ballpark, you're not going to do that well. And, and unless you're Chicago and you can spend a lot of money on renovating uh, uh, Wrigley Field or you're Boston where you can spend a lot of money on renovating Fenway Park, uh, the Oakland fan base and the political, uh, you know, um, influence that it has there, I, I'm, I feel bad for him. I really do. And I and I know in my heart goes out to Billy Bean because there's nothing more that he wants to do is win that last game. Oh, wow. You know, and he, his hands are tied. Uh, but th- there's one guy that I wanted to uh, mention to you as far as their pitching staff, who I'm impressed with. Uh, left-handed pitcher, and I can't recall who they got him from, but his name is Felix Dubront. I think he came from Toronto in the deal for, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong, for uh, Donaldson. Oh, but, well, if that's the case, if you've got him coming up and um, Franklin Barreto, maybe they can make some sort of um, – uh, that could end up looking good for the A's in the long run because Donaldson has flourished. Donaldson's a superstar. And um, and it took them a long time to develop him. He came up as a catcher first. Um, that was very sad that they lost him, and it's a, just a state of, state of the way things are for them. And um, you almost, as a franchise, you almost want to put them out of their misery if they can go to Las Vegas or someplace or San Antonio or this, and maybe somebody will build them a stadium and maybe they can flourish. But I'm shocked by I didn't hear that news that they're going to bring two more teams in. Yes, you said it right. Baseball has to take care of their fledgling franchises who are in a state of flux before they can add more teams and thin thin it out even more. I I don't like that at all. That's yeah, no, and, I, and I'll just give you, I'll underscore this a little bit too. I'm case in point, Houston Astros, they built a new ballpark. They went, into, they went to the World Series in 05, right, or 04. Uh, so they built a new ballpark downtown Houston, and things started to change for that organization. And now they're going to be a force to reckon with in the American League West. Tampa Bay and Oakland are the two eyesores of Major League Baseball right now, and it's over stadium issues. Tampa Bay, fortunately, has a winning 
uh, winning tradition, or they have over the last several years. Uh, but they're in a, in a in a bad situation because they're playing in a in Tropicana Field and nobody goes to watch them. And you know now there's talk, there's discussion about building another ballpark up in Montreal. We could see Tampa go to Montreal. Who knows? I don't know. But those two ball clubs, because of their stadium situation, uh, are are you know they're they're every other major league club has a venue that is exceptional, you know, and uh, unfortunately for the Oakland Athletics and the Tampa Bay Rays, they're both in a situation where it's, it's money, part, partly money, but a lot of it is the politics. And who's going to have their hand in the cookie jar? Who wants, you know, they, they all want a cut of something. And it's an unfortunate the big, thing. The big elephant in the room is the fact that the Giants own territorial rights, or they think they do, or it was set up to San Jose. And the A's are wanted in San Jose. And um, why is baseball um, cutting off their nose to spite their face on this one? You know, I, I really don't even understand all of that. Uh, obviously, the Giants feel that that is their territory, <clears throat> which I think in a, in, to a certain degree is unfortunate. Um, you know, because if, if, if they're six miles away across water, how, how big of a, what big, what's the big deal if they're 35 miles south of them? Well, That's what I, I don't is- get. The big I, I, just, is I don't get it. The Silicon Valley and the money down there compared to the money in Oakland. But let me tell you, there's big money in Oakland, too. Oakland is not a small little town, and they're looked at as this small market. Oakland has, um, what with the ports and what have you, they have, um, and if you want to take their outlying areas, Contra Costa, Danville, you know, Walnut Creek, all that, Livermore. They've got they've got a fan base, and um, it it's you need an owner in that is either going to stay or go. That's how I look at it. And um, the fans suffer. I think the better the Oakland A's got, the better it would be for the Giants. Competition, interleague series, that sort of thing. Wouldn't it be great to play Subway Subway Series type thing again, recreate 89 in real life? Um, I don't think it, the, it would hurt the Giants for the A's to be good. I think there's enough for everybody. And um, if that has to happen in San Jose, it would be better than it happening in San Antonio. I'd re- I'm, I live near Oakland, but I'd rather see a game in San Jose than watch it on television from Oakland, from San Antonio. So from a fan fan standpoint, and from the standpoint of kids, any time a major league franchise leaves, it's devastating for a young fan. It's not fair for a kid to lose his or her team over politics. I agree with you. I agree wholeheartedly. So that's why these knuckleheads have to get together and and get into action. They need to get a solution because it isn't that hard. It really isn't. Uh, but when you have egos involved and people wanting to have their cut of the uh, of the share or whatever it is, you know, we need to put that aside because there's enough for everyone to go around. And um, you know, it, it's it's it is a sad sort of thing, and it's a power it's a power struggle too with the Giants and the A's and and letting them relocate down there. I I personally don't think that San Jose really is a major league town, and 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 that's just my own opinion. I thought it may be at one time, but I don't know if you know. I, I don't think that the 49ers have been exemplary of that. I think that they've fallen flat on their face in their decision to move down there. Uh, a lot of that, obviously, is ownership and management. I get that. I understand that whole thing. Uh, well, they did have this big jam of a ballpark built. I'm sure the raking it. Well, you know, and I don't know if the ITers are big sports fans. I mean, they're good at making games and such, but would they be able to really support 
a major league club. Nobody really knows that. It almost becomes a social issue where you have the you getting tickets, just like the Giants. I think talking about the fans, a lot of the Giants have gone to the court. The, a lot of the fans of the Giants are corporate fans, who you can make an argument aren't as passionate as the maybe fifteen thousand loyal A's fans. So there's a lot of that when you sell out to corporate interests to build the beautiful stadium. You know. Well, the, you know, the, 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 I think that in the Giants' situation, they've sold out every home game for the last five years. Absolutely. There's not been an empty seat in the house, and I think a lot of that is Silicon Valley money. It's Peninsula money. You know, it's coming up from the peninsula, uh, and as well as the city and the North Bay as well, you know. But I think the, just the way they've orchestrated everything, and the bottom line is they're, they're doing that because they're winning. You know, the, the Giants have put together an organization and restructured that whole thing from the early 90s to what it is today, uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get it to a place where they are now. And because they're winning – you know, that certainly helps their cause. And they're putting money back into it, too. It's not like they're sitting on that money. But um, they went out and they got the guy for Cueto from Cincinnati. They're paying the bucks. And, boy, is that ever a starting rotation, especially if Kane could come back a little bit. Um, their Cueto is terrific. Imagine Cueto being with – with a whip of like one 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 being your second pit, pitcher, and the yeah, Timmy situation—that's that's intriguing to me, Timmy, because of we never know what to expect from this guy. This guy can recreate himself and could be a, either a closer or a setup man, lefty specialist. Um, I think the Giants may may serve themselves well to give him a shot. Well, yeah, I, I don't know if I agree with that. I think that Tim Lincecum, I think, is uh, as, as wonderful and as great as he was. I, I think that the Giants have too many guys that are ahead of him. You know, if you're going to put a list of people together, Lincecum might be 15th on that list of non-roster guys or non-25-man roster guys now because the Giants are so deep and so strong in their pitching uh, – Lincecum just isn't as good as those guys. Um, does it mean that he's not going to be successful and not get on with another club? I think he will, and I think he'll do well. Um, but I, I, I see him being most successful in a long reliever role or a purpose type of situation, maybe even as a closer. I don't know how hard he's throwing right now. Some are saying he's throwing in you know, the low to mid-90s again. I don't know. I haven't seen it. And it, it's a big secret because he's been putting off the showcase now several times. Um, but I don't see him being in a Giants uniform just for the sake of, you know, of, of a, an emotional signing. I don't think so. Um, and I don't think that he'd be even willing to take an offer from the Giants because I don't think that they would, have, they would extend that kind of money that he's been used to making. Uh, I think he has to, he's had to reinvent himself. He's going to have to reinvent himself. And I think that I'm going to see Tim Lincecum in a Miami Marlins uniform or a Pittsburgh Pirates uniform. That's kind of where I'm leaning towards. I think he can help bolster two young staff um, like that as opposed to being a, the odd man out with the Giants. You mentioned Miami, and that has to be a story with Barry Bonds being their batting coach. Well, it is. I think it's great opportunity for Barry. You know, uh, I got to see him last week, unfortunately, at the at Jimmy Davenport's memorial. But uh, he looks Barry looks great. He's excited. He and he just absolutely loves being back in baseball. Uh, I don't know what kind of a teacher he is, but I can tell you, I think that he's matured. I think that he he's going to be good in, in relating what he knows and has uh, to being a good hitting instructor. Um, but you know what? Just because you were great at playing doesn't mean that you can be good at relating stuff to young guys. Case in point, uh, Ted Williams, he tried to manage. He's thinking the exact same thing, of course. So, and he, of course, on the same level as Barry Bonds as a ball player, 
uh, but he just wasn't uh, that good at communicating to the younger players. And some of those guys that are that exceptional as players have an issue in communicating to, to the other guys. We don't know. The jury is out. Um, he has a great young um, roster to work with, with Stanton and Osich, or uh, not Osich, but Yolich or Yelich out there in, in Miami. Um, they're going to be an exciting club. I like their ball team. I really do. Uh, if they can stay healthy, they're going to be competitive in that um, National League East. Uh, but uh, Long shot for the season. Can you pick one team where you say, wow, this team's going to come up? Well, the one ball club I think that uh, – is going to, I think, is going to continue to get better and surprise some play, uh, people as Houston. I think that they're starting to develop uh, a really good, strong organizational uh, foundation. Uh, they've got a decent pitching staff. Uh, they've got some incredibly young, incredibly talented young ta- uh, players. Um, I think the Houston Astros are going to be a, a good ball club. Um, but you know what? I, I that was probably the, the only sleeper. Maybe the Minnesota Twins. I think that they performed really well last year. Um, they did a lot better than what everybody expected. I think that the leadership that they have with Paul Molitor is except, you know, that's, he, that goes beyond words, what he brings to that organization. That is, that is a low key, classy guy, Paul Molitor. He is just a great guy. And I would have, if I were uh, 22 again, I'd love to play for Paul Molitor. But, uh, you know, those two teams, uh, I think are going to be surprises. On the other side, I don't think Toronto is, is going to be as good as they were last year. Uh, I think that, uh, Oakland, or excuse me, the Yankees are going to be a strong club to contend with. I think the Orioles are going to be better than what everybody thinks. Um, but I don't think Toronto has got, got that, that makeup. I think that they wrote a lot on emotion. There's some, uh, grumbling going on in that clubhouse right now with uh, their right fielder and what he thinks he deserves he should be making. Um, I don't think that the Washington Nationals have a chemistry or uh, uh, they have some great ball players, but I don't think that they've shown yet that they can play together as a team. Uh, the guys that you're going to see are the, are the same old clubs, Kansas City, the Giants, the Cardinals, the Cubs are up and up and coming. And I think that, the the presence of, of of Joe Madden there is really the the huge impact on that ball club. Uh, the Dodgers are going to be competitive. We know that. We're that the the jury is still out really with them with the new management and what they're going to try to do with that outfield. Um, I don't think the Diamondbacks are going to be as good as everybody thinks they will be just because you sign a guy for thirty four million dollars a year. As a starting pitcher, doesn't mean that's going to be the, uh, you know, the end all to that. How many that, pitchers have uh, worked out? How few pitchers have worked out in the long run for <laughs> signings? Right. I mean, uh, you know, they've got a great player in Goldschmidt, but you know, the Giants to me are the club to beat. You know, in that division, uh, they're right. just so deep. Even if Pence is out of that lineup for a period of time, they have some guys that can play. And, uh, and, you know, the Giants have been very fortunate in the last couple of years. When a guy goes down, they've got somebody knocking on the door. Very v- much similar to that of the St. Louis Cardinals organization. Boy, the Cardinals, if every preseason since I'm a kid, you could always count on the Cardinals being solid. I don't think they've had a, a horrible year, uh, more than three in the last 40 that is an organization and always has been. There's something about that St. Louis Cardinal team that um, – can you – anything there that's a common denominator, anything in there? Well, they're consistent, obviously. Their ability to develop players and, and have them slip right into that major league roster is phenomenal. But right. I think – Matheny is a terrific manager – um, he is. Uh, he was a giant for a, a short period of time. He was a guy that was uh, had a concussion. That, yeah, he was uh, uh, concussions as, as well. I think he's a great leader. Uh, and and you'll you'll agree with this. Catchers can make great managers. They really do. Absolutely. You know, uh, but the Cardinals, to me, are really they epitomize 
over the years, I mean decades, of consistency. And always being able to compete and be at the top of their division or the National League uh, and win their share of world championships year in and year out. You know, I, I don't recall the Cardinals ever really having a subpar year. Now, I, I obviously don't pay as much attention to this uh, National League Central and the, well, when, even when they were in the Eastern Division. <laughs> <laughs> but they were always very competitive, and uh, they they really are the the epitome epitome of a great organization. Right. Well, um, they go back in my head to a guy in 1953 named Rip Rapulski, and I always thought when I'm four or five, six years old, that was a baseball name, Rip Rapulski. <laughs> that was a well, I, I think Red Changings is a pretty good one. Uh, Stan was another really good one. No. Dizzy Dean was another good one. They they all they got they don't always have great ball clubs and great teams. They have some really great names. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, all through the years. And um, but my last name when I was a kid, I'm a Tycho now. My father had to change when I was in kindergarten. I was a Tikachinsky. So a Rip Rapulski would, appe- would appeal to a kid named Tikachinsky. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's hard to, and not only, oh, that, they had Enos Slaughter and back in those days. What a tradition of gas house. Oh, bang. absolutely. You know, one of the guys who gets overlooked a lot is Willie McGee. What a great baseball name. Willie McGee. A, Willie a McGee a was a great center fielder. Right. A Bay Area yeah. guy out in Richmond, or is it Pinole somewhere? Yeah, he was Diablo College, Diablo, Diablo Junior College, and you know, just a you know Bay Area native and um, another great Bay Area baseball talent. But Willie McGee, man, what a great baseball name! Now, that just rolls right. If I'm an announcer, I'd like to say Willie McGee forty times in a game. Well, just if you're a Mets fan, when you think of Willie McGee, you think of he and Coleman. And that Whitey Her- those Whitey Herzog years, and um, was it McGee and Coleman? I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it was. And Jack Clark and Tommy Herr and and uh, yeah. Ozzy, uh, you know, Gary Gaetti played third base for him for a little while after Minnesota. Uh, those, and Terry Pendleton prior to him, those guys could play. Keith yeah. Hernandez, he went to New York. I mean, those guys. We're always competitive. Absolutely. You mentioned Clark. You're a friend of his. Yes, dear friend. Uh, you know, of course, most of my memories are from when I was a, just a lad and he was playing right field at Candlestick and, you know, getting to throw the ball to him between innings and, and play catch uh, and just being around him in that clubhouse. And in the wintertime, we would work out together at the ballpark. And uh, he, to me, was my he was my idol. He was to me larger than life. He was just a mountain of a man, incredibly strong and talented. Um, and I saw him hit some baseballs that were absolute lasers. Uh, he hit a ball off Bob Welch one time in Dodger Stadium, and I was I got to go down with the club and and Bat Boy um, one you know one year and. He hit a ball off Bob Welch that couldn't have gone more than 15 feet off the ground and hit the back corrugated steel of the left field bullpen at Dodger Stadium. It it was unbelievable. Yeah, um, you're blessed. You you've had a great life. You know that, Timmy. Well, I'm pretty fortunate, and it has been a lot of fun. You know, and I love to talk about it. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm always 110% accurate, but the memories, uh, you know, for the most part are still there. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate and blessed to have grown up in, in the way that I did and, and to the parents that, that, you know, that I was chosen to be with. Um, I'll tell you, uh, hey, you know, it's you know, been a charm Your dad and your uncle, tell me about your mom a little bit. I know she took over. Uh, as any baseball wife would have to. But um, tell me a little bit about her and the effect she's had on you over the years. You know, uh, 
a mom has, you know, she she was in charge because dad was gone so much. She 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 did everything, and and what I I really remember most about her is uh, well a couple of things. When I was growing up, I was always at the ball game, whatever it was, you know. And and when I was young and I I didn't have a driver's license yet. She always took me to the games, made sure that I, you know, my uniform was washed and cleaned and um, the schedule was on the, it was magnetized to the refrigerator. Um, she was very big with that. She never missed the ball game uh, growing up. As a matter of fact, uh, my junior year of high school, she was actually our scorekeeper. She was our official scorekeeper. Uh, you know, so she was very active in my, in my, when I was a youth and, and playing ball. Uh, but even prior to those years, she she held it together. I mean, Dad was gone eight months out of the year for the most part, you know, and she had to do everything. And uh, she was a trooper. Um, and I don't think that she would have uh, have stuck around if my dad wasn't such a great guy either, because a lot of ball players their eyes wander and they they have a, a, a lifestyle choices that aren't always becoming for those that want to have families, et cetera. So I think the two of them were perfectly made for each other. They were high school sweethearts. They they grew up together. You know, they went to high school together. Um, and the core values that they were taught by their parents, um, you know, certainly was handed down to them as well. But mom, mom is what kept it together. And unfortunately today she's, she's on the decline. She's, um, her health she has several health issues and you know um you know it's just a part of life and it's reality uh but uh she has been uh the 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 brick and mortar you know for the Haller clan um for all these years and um you know I'm really grateful for her and um that's very well spoken and made me cheer up a little bit Timmy I'm I'm sorry your mom's on the decline. That's um, It's all part of it, but still, it doesn't make it any easier for any of us when we have to go through it. Um, mortality, you are not my friend in any way, shape, or form. We're going to end it, Timmy. We'll come back next week, and we'll do more, pay more homage to the A's next week. Um, uh, I'm enjoying the hell out of this. You're a natural, Timmy. Well, I'm really liking it, and um, uh, again, I'm going to miss uh, our Saturday night next week, but we'll do it Friday or Sunday, and then the week the week after, Bill Lasky will be our special guest. So in two weeks, we we got we look forward to listening to the to the tree, as they call them. I'm so, going to bring in somebody for next time we talk, uh, somebody from the East Bay, maybe uh, um, Ken Corich, who's been a guest. Uh, on my other shows and maybe he can give us a, a rundown on the A's and um, we'll try to try to keep it as balanced as we can. It's not easy keeping it balanced. Uh, <laughs> when you're an old New York giant fan and a, and a bat boy of the San Francisco fan, we tend to talk about the giants more, but I'm going to make a concerted effort or just say, change the name of the damn show. I could do that too. <laughs> Well, I, I agree. I want to do a little bit more homage to the A's as well because they're just as deserving, uh, and they have just as great as great a history as the San Francisco Giants do. I uh, yeah, they do, they do absolutely do. It is even, and it is wonderful for me. I didn't think it was because I was, as an old New York Giant fan, I have a, I've been an apologist, but. Um, not a real true fan. Nice to see the real loyal fans getting their, getting their day in the sun. I mean, they've had three. If they win this year, we're talking about definite Hall of Fame for Bochy and Rigetti. Definite. And I'll tell you, Bochy, um, these guys should go in whether they win this year or not. But... Um, and you got to uh, give a lot of credit to Larry Bear and um, even even the guy from Safeway. I, um, 
can't think of his yeah, name. Yeah, Peter McGowan. Peter McGowan. McGowan. Um, I wasn't always a big fan of the way they went through things, um, the way they handled the Bonds thing, but that was all of baseball. It wasn't just the Giants. And um, I was happy that, to see them win, get get three rings. Three rings, well, the, when you know how long that they waited and – um, wow, it's nice. It's cool. So it'll be an effort for us, but we'll. There's a great tradition with the A's too, and we'll we'll pay our homage to it. We got a lot of time, and uh, I'm loving this, Timmy. Keep doing it for me and with me. All right. Um, All right. Thanks. Thanks, Ralph, and, and be well, everybody. You too, everybody. Be well and keep on keeping on. That's the only thing I can tell you. As I say, time after time. Life's a roller coaster. When you're up, you're up. When you're down, you're down. Try not to let anybody know if you're up or down. If you just have that same personality at all times, don't get too high, don't get too low. Makes it easier to deal with life. And um, that's about it for tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, Timmy. I did. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>